I'll pay you. Like I'll pay you now. <laughs> like how's how's that validation? Yeah. I, and I and the answer yeah. is is no. <laughs> it's yeah. just no. Like like no, you cannot pay me. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna release a course and I need to focus. Like that was yeah. it. But then what happened? They carried on. They carried on asking me. They carried on asking me. Mm-hmm. And I thought mm-hmm. to myself, wow, are we really gonna do an ebook now? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Plugin.fm podcast, which is powered by Freemius. In this podcast, I sit down with a different inspiring guest every week, and we talk about their experience in entrepreneurship and life. We're going to go deep into their strategies, practices, and the bag of tricks they've developed to succeed. My name is Patrick Rolland, and today I'll be talking with maker and optimist Rob Hope from the mother city, aka Cape Town, South Africa. He's both a web designer and developer, and in his free time, he's an enthusiastic bird watcher, surfer, and trail runner. He's also a solopreneur who has used some pretty creative growth hacks to scale his business, Love Curated, which celebrates simple, elegant design. While growth hacking is the meat of today's conversation, a person is more than their business. As a twitcher, he loves birds. As a punk rocker, he loves bands. And as a South African, he loves his country's national drink, beer. All this makes you wonder where he finds the time to grow his various projects, and there are a few. As a fan of slick minimalist design, Rob Created... OnePageLove.com, which is all about one-page websites. This side hustle is now his full-time job, and we'll get into that in today's show. I've already mentioned Love Curated. He also runs the Yo! Podcast, which spotlights talented designers and developers. And finally, the Hot Tips landing page ebook, which really showcases the growth hacking tricks he has up his sleeve. Whew! Rob, welcome to the show. Wow, that was a mouthful. Thank you for having me, Patrick. I just want to say... Big shout out to Vova. I'm a big fan of him and what he's doing with Freemius, and it's an honor to be on your guys' podcast. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Uh, let's start with growth hacking. Um, so growth hacking is a pretty broad topic. Um, and on one hand, you have enterprise-level growth hacking where businesses have whole teams devoted uh dedicated to scaling super fast. You know, there's usually a, some sort of special development team and they have a you know product manager, project manager, designer. They have they have everything they need to like scale incredibly fast. Uh, they also have large budgets for ads if they need them. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have solopreneurs who have to promote and grow with very limited resources and costs. So as a solopreneur, I'm guessing that you develop some sort of you know some combination of creative tricks. Uh, what about what about growth hacking interests and drives you? How did you how did you get into it? So growth hacking for me is need it's needed, you know, if you want a successful product for sure. And you know, it's it is a bit of a dark art. Um, you can't just ignore ignore growth hacking. Um, but what I'm what draws me to it is it's actually quite difficult. And mm. um, you have to be creative. You have to think mm-hmm. of ideas that other people aren't really doing. And you know, being a solo guy, I like the idea of building once. And sort of selling twice so this is putting effort in place and then you know reaping the rewards um, often passively so you know i like to think up ways how can we get creative with the projects we have um you know a huge one which we're going to talk about later in the podcast is you know distribution an idea is only so good um you know often you know an experienced maker or developer will say okay that's a cool idea but what's the distribution plan and mm-hmm. Growth, this is where growth hacking, you know, comes in and say, well, in my old project, you know, we, we launched this idea on Twitter um, we got creative. We pulled in these ideas from failed projects. It's quite a remix of a lot of your marketing ideas, a lot of failing. Mm. Um, and it, and, and it's, it's me being creative though. That's what, so it's creative marketing, mm. uh, it's mm. distribution. Um, one thing I want to say, just added on growth hacking is that it's, it's, it's difficult. Like back to where I started is that, and often when things are difficult, that's, People are reluctant and people don't want to do distribution. Growth hacking is yourself failing in public. And often that's where the magic is, is that you need to do difficult things to grow and hence growth hacking. Can I, so I I want to stay on this for a second. Is growth hacking something you do? Like, let's say, okay, so let's say you write an ebook. Is growth hacking something you do day one? Or is it something you do after, let's say, you've you've got some sort of product market validation where you know that people are really interested in this and you're getting, I don't know, let's say 10 sales a week. You know, you're getting some sort of interest all on your own, but instead of, you know, 10 sales a week, which is pocket money, 
you want to increase that to 100 sales a week, which is something you can live off of. Like when, when do you start growth hacking? Yeah, so I mean, the, the ideation of it, you, you're thinking of it from the very beginning. I think if you cannot mm. answer growth hacking from the idea phase, it's almost not a green light. You, okay. you, there needs to be ways to market. And you must also remember that once you have launched your product, you will hit that dip, you will run out of steam. And these are often little tricks. I don't like using the word tricks, but these are little hacks in place mm -hmm. that can help do the work for you passively. So, you know, when does it actually happen? Yeah, sure. When you want to get your ebook selling from 10 a week to 20 a week, sure. Like, and a lot of it's experimenting. And, you know, for me, a lot of the best um, little hacks I did for my ebook happened when I was in the middle of the journey. There's no ways mm. I could have thought of that in the beginning. So mm -hmm. we adapted, we pivoted, we saw an opportunity. I say we, yeah. you know, I, I like to think of myself with my with my own products. But um, uh -huh. it, it's like I use a good example for this is that uh, a growth hack can be a coupon. It can be a coupon that just has a ring to it. Um, so you can launch a coupon on one platform and it really doesn't work. But then I thought of um, a coupon saying for the next 30 hours, it's $30 off. Uh -huh. So it was like 30 for 30. And that's that's a, a small form of a growth hack. It's an experiment. Yeah. I don't know if it land. Yeah. It just had a ring to it. A lot of people who took the deal, I spoke to them and they were like, wow, man, you put the pressure on, uh -huh. you created that haste, and I knew I only had 30 and I could, it was just so memorable, 30 of 30, let's go. And it was like such a great deal because the book was 49 and went down to 19, massive deal, but 30 for 30. So there, it just organically sort of went that way. So yeah, to answer your question, um, as you go, you keep you keep on brainstorming. You fail. You I've failed a lot growth hacking. Yeah, um, but yeah, you got to do it in public, and often there's a reward. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I what what you just said is you know it, it sounds like it's mostly about experimentation, and I, I think mm. one of the cool things about digital is you can try everything, and even let's say nine nine out of ten ideas are bad ideas. If you get yeah. one out of 10, that's a really good idea. You just leave that in place and then you keep experimenting. So it seems like it's it, it's just, you always want to just, just keep learning, run as many experiments as possible, and then obviously leave the experiments that are positive in place and then just keep building on that. Is that like a- Absolutely. A, okay, cool, cool. And refine it. And I'll, I'll drop another one just while we add it, just to mm -hmm. try and add a little value. So I got to, we will talk about this. I got this hundred email drip. Mm -hmm. And it's a hundred day email drip. You sign up for a um, hundred days of landing page uh -huh. hot tips. And every single day for a hundred days, you're going to get a tip. And I thought to myself, what is a good point in this drip to drop a really saucy discount? And I was like, what's a good discount? <laughs> okay. So I was like, 70% is a very good one. But also you want to reward the people that stuck around for 70 days. Uh -huh. So on the 70th email drip, I, I go, wow, you're really into these tips. Here's seventy yeah. percent off on the seventieth email, and again. So I still, to this day, in this books, you know, yeah. this book was released two years ago. I still get notifications yeah. every now and again, going, "Yeah, this coupon code, you know, tip seventy was used." So there it again. Yeah. It's like that one's that one's a winner. And guess what I'll do next if I launch an email hot tips book? Guess what yeah. I'll do in that one? I will do exactly the same thing. So yes, reusing um, your learnings, implementing, refining. Love that. So let, let's talk about that because that is, that's actually yeah. a really cool thing. I, um, I've built some email campaigns in the, in the past, some email automation, and I would say ours are like the ones that I've usually worked on are like a dozen long. So a hundred long email mm -hmm. sequence is pretty cool. Um, uh, just, just on its, uh, on its face. Um, but what made you hone in on that segment of like web design? Why did you talk about landing page w landing pages? Like what, what makes that interesting and what makes you think there was an opportunity there? Okay, so you know, often I'm not a big when it comes to validating ideas where I'm trying to find a segment of the market with a lot of you know money happening. A good example right now is the uh, you know AI profile you know images, which is yes. absolutely exploding. Um, yes, it's it's exciting. I love to see what they're doing, and I like to play TV games with it. And like, oh, if I was doing that, I would you know do that and that and that. But it's not a passion of mine. Um, I couldn't mm. imagine spending eight hours a day tweaking mm. some code for an AI generator. So, but that right now, you know, validation and, and getting there, the trends are all there. But for me, I'm passionate about simple design. And in 2008, um, which we'll get to further on about One Page Love, is that I had a website where I was curating simple design. I was trying to find my own references. 
couldn't find enough references. So I, I started this gallery hmm. using WordPress. And through the years and, and through the experience and building websites for clients and convincing them they only need one page websites, um, I was building a lot of landing pages. So just for context for everyone out there is, you know, a single page website is a website with no second page. There's no about page. There's no contact page. All the details are on one simple long scrolling page. And if this one page website asks the user to do something and they do that, that is known as a conversion. And so the good example there is sign up for our newsletter, um, buy our ebook, download this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and or contact us that's even for our mm -hmm. photography service and that's known as a conversion and when a one page website has a conversion that's that's also known as a landing page so landing beca pages became my world i was building them i was curating them i was giving audits about them and naturally i thought you know the online education game looks exciting i can be creative in this i can make the course that i've always wanted to take i can integrate music I can outsource some animations, can have a lot of fun with this. And what actually happened is that it became so overwhelming um, creating an online course targeting landing pages. Mm -hmm. And I just started collecting references. And my mm -hmm. I, it, at the time, it was a Trello board. And it was just thousands of landing page designs and components and tips. And these are pricing psychology and so on. It was the most overwhelming thing you'd ever seen. I used to open up Trello and go, oh, my word, I can't. So I put it off. Can I work on the mm -hmm. course? Can I work on the course? And one day I just woke up and I said, this is never going to ship. I need to be accountable. I need to announce this and I need to put something mm -hmm. in place to help me uh -huh. clear this absolute bird's nest of landing page advice. And I, I just one day came to me. I obviously had seen people doing tips online and on Twitter and yep. so on. And I just said to myself, you know what would be amazing? If I just told people right now, starting tomorrow, I'm going to start. I'm going to share a hundred tips in a hundred days. So uh -huh. <laughs> about the niche is that obviously is something that was in my world. Landing pages um, and the ability to tell a story within one page, it forces you to get to the point. There's not a lot uh -huh. of fluff. There's just so many um, dimensions to why I appreciate a one page website. And that's why I'm still going in, in 2022 after starting in 2008. So it was a bit of a, a side ramble to how we got here with the ebook. Uh -huh. But why web design is I was involved in web design. I had my own web design curated gallery um, and I was planning an online course yeah. to do with web design. Can, so let me, let me follow up on this. It sounds like, so one of the, one of the things that I've been working on for, on myself is whenever something gets hard, do less. And it sounds mm -hmm. like, like, cause usually it's like you have crazy big ambitions and yeah, I want to make a course with an accompanying ebook and then we'll have an audio book and we'll have worksheets and we'll have a discord and a Facebook group. And like I, that, that is what, where I naturally go. And then when I can't launch my project, I need to scale back. Is that kind of what you did? Did you change, did you change your product? Cause it sounds like you wanted to do way more. And then you just started with a hundred tips uh, as, as a starting point, just to get it out the door. So it organically landed there. And um, mm. let's, let's just go there, you know, related to the question is that I, I, it would help me sort, it was like a hack as well. It, it would help me sort my notes, um, mm. you know, sorting a hundred tips. It, I need to, you know, spread all the categories within landing page design. So there would be pricing tips, there would be design tips, optimization, development, and so on. And it really was an incredible exercise. And because I needed to, you know, write it in email every single day. It forced me, I was accountable every single day. It went off 9 a.m. US time. I also paired it with 100 tweets in 100 days. It went off exactly mm -hmm. the same time. And because of the, the Twitter character constraints, I had to get straight to the meat of the actual tip. It, it alongside image and just straight into the tip as, as little words as possible. And it's, it's funny, you know, reliving this all in hindsight. At the time, it, I really was trying to build up some hype towards my landing page course. Mm -hmm. I really was. And what actually happened is that the drip was on, you know, tip number 32, people on yeah. the, the, the 32nd tweet in the long thread. And people would, would mail me and go, Rob, can I please have all hundred tips right now? Uh -huh. And I'm going, uh -huh. first of all, I, like I hadn't finished all hundred. I, I jotted out like a hundred or so he headlines, uh -huh. which I, uh -huh. I knew I had, I had the confidence I could talk about it with a little bit of time, but it wasn't ready. 
And people go like, but I'll pay you. Like, I'll pay you now. <laughs> like, how's, how's that validation? Yeah. I, and, I, and the answer yeah. is, is no. <laughs> it's yeah. just no. Like, like, no, you cannot pay me. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release a course and I need to focus. Like, that was yeah. it. But then what happened? They carried on. They carried on asking me. They carried on asking me. Mm -hmm. And I thought mm -hmm. to myself, wow, are we really going to do an ebook now? That's honestly what I thought. Yeah. I was like, are we going to really do an ebook when we started off with a goal to do a proper video course? You know, that yeah. was the goal. Are we really going to yeah. stray from this? Yeah. And I chatted to a few maker friends and entrepreneurs and so on. And they're like, validation doesn't just knock on the door like this. Um, yeah. How much, you know, extra work it's going to be to put it into a digital format. And it's not that much extra work. You know, the work's already done. It's all in HTML mm -hmm. format through the email drip. Mm -hmm. Uh, the imagery is done. I spent so much time in in Figma creating this little, mm -hmm. you know, don't do that, do that framework. Yep. And and then the true validation came. And um, another a little growth hack, just to throw it in there, yeah, is on tip number fifty. That was my my pre sale. So it, oh, cool. we're now on on tip number fifty, and the tip was about creating haste. It was about yeah. adding a countdown timer in your landing page. And I uh -huh. did the most meta thing ever, but the pre-sale had a countdown timer for uh -huh. the landing page Hot Tips ebook pre-sale. And the pre-sale I think was, was $19. And um, I said, this is the countdown timer. I think it was available for you know X amount of time. Oh, sorry, that was I think that was also the 30 and 30. So that was you know, 49 uh -huh. minus 30. Anyway, countdown timer, the tip was about the, the countdown timer. I used the coupon on, on, on mm -hmm. Twitter and then it was just an absolute ridiculous experience on my phone. I, I'd always seen other indie hackers out there get uh -huh. those kind of sales where yeah. like you get a notification every like three minutes and yeah. I'm like, no ways, no ways, no ways. And you know, there's, there's, there's so much to say about this, but you know, did I, you know, pivot the product? Absolutely. It's like we created this product and the more I invested in it, and the more I started promoting it online, going, actually, you know what? Presale had such a great response. Um, I think I'm going to do an audiobook. And as soon as I started sharing behind the scenes of like making the audiobook and so on, more presale, uh -huh. more presale, more presale, more presale. Oh, cool. The presale amount eventually went up. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot covered there. But the story there was did the did the item pivot? Um, did the did yeah. the course pivot? The course is not live. There is no course. <laughs> It's yeah. still an ebook. So yeah. yes, um, to answer your question, yes, it did pivot. It, it it's funny how it, it's just to me, you took something from the jaws of defeat and you turned it into a major victory. And there's something <laughs> really cool about, you know, it's like uh, for an example for me is like, I really want to go on a 10 mile run. Oh, I don't want to go on a 10 mile run today. Okay, well, how about a three mile run? Okay, I can do that. And like a three mile run actually going every week is way better for me than like really wanting to go on a 10 mile run, but then not working up the energy to do so. And I just, I'm just a big fan of like shipping something rather than nothing. And, th and then you can always build on that success in your case, right? Add the audiobook later, stuff like that. So love all that. I, I did want to touch Absolutely. on marketing. So yeah. So um, it was, it sounds like it was mostly Twitter and then email. Is that correct? Yeah. Now I, I guess my, my question is, and Twitter's going through a weird phase right now with, with current, current events, but I, it, do you need to have a Twitter following to get something like this going? Can you have a tiny Twitter audience and still market something like this on Twitter or, or any social network, you know, TikTok or whatever? So the short answer is you absolutely do not have to have a big Twitter following, but mm -hmm. it does not hurt having one. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was, I've been on Twitter for a long time and I've kind of kept things, I, I've gone through phases of promo. Um, but what you often find is the people that do best are the people that uh, try and add value. Um, a lot of people are failing in public, sharing lessons. There's a lot of guys flexing and so on, which isn't the mm -hmm. best. And it's actually becomes a little, little bit a place where you question your mental health, checking every day, you know, it's what's happening, you know, I'm a failure and so on. And it happens to everyone. But with Twitter, you can start speaking about a niche and then you can also search the you can search the conversation. I can search the mm -hmm. word landing pages mm -hmm. on Twitter. People are talking about landing pages. I can DM if I want. I, I'm not playing those games. I'm just saying you don't need the biggest Twitter following yeah. to actually engage with people that are speaking about your niche. Um, yeah. Twitter for me, 
became uh, just a, an area where I was doing the threads. I know threads performed really well. It became a real estate mm-hmm. thing. Um, people are qu- abusing it quite badly right now. I totally abused it for that period. Um, I, f- I still feel bad about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but when you when you tweet on a threaded research surfaces the first one. Luckily, mm-hmm. my first one, and this is a real big takeaway. Like a, a, in hindsight, like what was v- what was very clever was including the link to sign up on the email drip in my first mm-hmm. tweet. Mm-hmm. So I wrote yep. there, I said, if Twitter's not your jam, it's like, get these delivered on email. And so what had happened is I would, you know, tweet tip number 64, and then that did really well. You know, not all of them did well, but sometimes it would do well. But what it would do is resurface tw- tweet number one with the email drip. Yep. And I was getting subscribers to that email drip every single day for a hundred yeah. days. Yeah. And it's just it just becomes this machine that's happening in the background. Um, but to answer your question on Twitter is that it, Twitter is also, it can be as wholesome as you want it. You, must, you mustn't forget that mm-hmm. as well. You can also, f- mm. there, there's some real brilliant people out there just sharing the odd thing on Twitter. And that's all you need. You know, you can integrate yes. with people. You can, I use Twitter for support. Um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the biggest Twitter fan, really am. Yeah. It's going through a phase, yeah. I agree. And especially yeah. when there was that, NFT phase and the crypto phase, yeah. and it was I, I had all the mutes on and all the words. Yes, um, I, I had to question my Twitter, my love for Twitter, but now I'm really enjoying it again. Yeah, I, this is a something that just you need to develop as a person who lives in the the digital age. But you have to know what like online networks give you energy and which ones take energy away. And anytime, like just anytime I follow politics. I just get angry and it's just, it's not worth it. So it's like, I don't join those groups. I don't join those mm-hmm. conversations and I focus on business stuff or, or, you know, I have lots of board game stuff, you know, so things that give me energy. So I, I, I think that's a always another good idea there for any social network. <clears throat> um, you, you talked about, okay, so we're talking about this book here. Can yeah. you share any analytics or insights? I'm, I'm a big analytics person. I love knowing, figuring out what, what was working and what, what's not working now and what might work. Uh, were there any analytics or insights from data that you got while promoting this book? Yeah, so just to try and add a bit of value and just throw in as much marketing as well at the same time as sharing data. You know, I'm, the guys online just sharing numbers and saying, "Yeah, my book did well." It's like, why did it do well? So mm-hmm. I need to. I, so first of all, I think just looking at yeah, I took a look just now. We're we're just about to cross two thousand sales, and um, the book's made about. Fifty-seven thousand dollars, which is, which is, which is great, man. It's like this book yeah. didn't even exist, and yeah. it still passively sells. And that's, I mean, like, forget the number. And like, I don't want to. Even if I told you it made ten thousand dollars right now, or or five hundred thousand dollars, like, sort of irrelevant that the fact that it's a layer of income right now, while I'm continuing with what I'm doing online, and the hard work done once is sold twice. And I'm just such a a, a fan of that model, especially being a solo guy yes. online, and. A big chunk of that revenue was to do with affiliates. So I Mm. want to talk about that. And I want to encourage a lot of people, you know, even with a plugin game, um, if you're doing an info product and so on, they really helped, you know, tied me through when there were dips, you know, sales dipped on my side. Then all of a sudden someone would do a promotion and then we would see that. So what I offered them is a a 50% of the ebook. Um, Often I would give them their own exclusive coupon so it felt yep. um, exclusive to their audience. So for example, yep. um, you know, if the coupon was Patrick and you tweeted to your, um, your friends and community and it mm-hmm. gave them $20 off, then what is ever was remaining, we just go 50-50. Mm-hmm. And that did really well. And I, I, gave, I gave them the option. What do you want to give your audience off? You know, sometimes, you know, an in, in Indian audience, for example, not as much as uh, pur- purchasing power, let's give mm-hmm. them a much bigger discount. Sure. Um, and that was, it was amazing. And just want to um, just go a little deeper on this point for anyone considering a referral program is that often people are out there, they, they've got websites, they're approached by so many people saying, can I do a guest blog? Yeah. Um, yeah. Can, can you promote my product? Um, often, luckily enough, a lot of the people, most of the people that um, are referring the book are the people that actually bought the book. Um, mm-hmm. But but what I would do is I would, you know, they would they would speak to me like I'm interested, and then I would look at their assets, 
and I would see their oh. ad blocks on their sites. Um, mm-hmm. And what I did is I created this super, super comprehensive um, you know, document. It's now in Notion just for mm-hmm. the affiliates, potential headlines to use, copy to use, all the yeah. books and the different angles, what not to do. Like, you know, it's basically a press kit. But, but I think the real kicker for them was I would tell them, um, hey, here's like a short code with your link, uh, your affiliate link applied, and it's got your coupon. Yeah. This one will give yep. you $10 off. This one will give you $20 off. And also here is the optimized JPEG for your design gallery and the exact dimensions. Uh-huh. And I've already optimized uh-huh. the speed for speed and stuff. It's retina uh-huh. and all that stuff. All you need to is replace your current ad. And, and yeah. that turnaround time, like pe- people would integrate that within 24 hours. Yes. There, there was no back and forth questions. And that yes. for me was a lot of work at, at first. And it still is a lot of work. Um, but that's just something I don't, want, I don't want anyone to leave here to overlook is the power of people referring. And don't forget is that they have a lot of people giving them noise. You got to cut through the noise and answer all their questions. Um, and that really worked for me. So yeah, you were talking about analytics. What else I learned? Um, AppSumo, uh-huh. don't ignore AppSumo. It's quite difficult uh-huh. to get in there. But again, if you have info product, it becomes passive. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they do Black Friday specials, for example, and you click a button going, I want to be involved in, you know, Black Friday. Then all of a sudden on Black Friday, you know, I made $80 or something. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, imagine apps, app, imagine AppSumo didn't exist. Um, yeah. I wouldn't have that layer. So I, I, it's, it's, yeah, a lot of experimenting. Um, with analytics, you know, did anything surprise me? Um, the, there was one little trick I did. Uh, I put a link in my Twitter bio mm-hmm. where I had a coupon code attached to that. So, and I, I, yep. I say basically my book is on sale now. Yeah. And and anyone who clicked that exact link in my bio, which is only found in that bio, um, mm-hmm. would go and it would apply a coupon discount and then they would buy it. And it was incredible um, how many sales I've got through my Twitter bio. So again, to answer your question about Twitter, is Twitter worth it? Yeah. Um, hundreds of sales through my Twitter bio, just from when someone is talking about the ebook and then I chime in and I say, hey, thanks for mentioning my ebook. Hey, let me know if I, if I want any questions. Within 12 minutes, the bio, it, it, the, uh, the, the bio link strikes. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so interesting. It's, it's, if you get engaged yeah. and you get in conversation on Twitter, people are, whoa, that's interesting. He's proactive. He enjoys his product. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so much to say about that. Okay. That's cool. I, and uh, before I forget, uh, we do actually have, speaking of special links, if you go to robhope.com slash freemius, there is a 50% off of his ebook. So if you've listened this far, which is roughly halfway through the podcast, uh, you will get 50% off. So we're uh, following that uh, tradition nicely there. Um, so yeah, robhope.com slash freemius. Um, awesome. So, okay, hinds- you know, hindsight's 20, 20. I'm a, I'm a, Whenever I finish a project, it's nice to think back on it and go, what worked, what didn't. Do you have, would, would you have done anything differently with hot tips now that it's, I don't want to say done, but now that it's launched and optimized, would you have, yeah, would you have done anything differently? Yeah, hindsight is amazing in 2020. And I will say that 100 tips in 100 days is very ambitious. Don't, mm. don't listen to this and go, Rob did 100 WordPress tips, um, you know, 100 tips to market your WordPress plugin. Um, I'm, I'm just going to do that. You have to flesh out the ideas. Get 150. If you cannot get 150 uh-huh. Uh-huh. pretty easily, you yeah. cannot do 100. I can get yeah. I can get 200 landing page tips. 100's easy. Um, but at the same time, you also need to ask yourself, what are you promising? Because 100 tips is more than is pretty much more than three months. Yeah. So if you are planning on launching something, and each tip does take a lot of time, yeah. What is at the end of this road? Is this road an actual launch of a course? I can't actually believe I thought I was going to do that here. Um, it's it's just that it's so much work involved in mm-hmm. get in staying. But the positive on this is being accountable reaps so many rewards. But be more realistic. So in hindsight, to answer your question, maybe fifty, maybe fifty would still would still have equal uh, of uh, you know sort of a attraction a 50 email mm-hmm. trip is still super long uh yeah. 50 tweets is long um and then at that point you're like hey you want another 50 yeah um you know in hindsight as well i gave away all 100 tips in the email drip 
yeah. I gave away all the content. And yeah. I just said, I said, hey, if you want, you know, a few more resources per tip, a couple more images and examples. Um, also, obviously, Notion book, audio book. Um, you know, there's yeah. so many different formats to consume other than email and search and so on. But I gave everything away. And uh -huh. in hindsight, was that smart? We'll never know. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that is, uh, I think in the digital world, there's a, a lots of people give everything away. And there is something yeah. about, I, I think I probably lean towards like give 90, 95% away and just keep your, keep, a, you have to keep a, a few things that are sort of exclusive. Um, otherwise, it, it it is a hard value. It, it is hard value for someone. They can just sit on the email list for a month or three months and, and get get them all. Um, yeah, that's I think, tricky. Um, I Adam Wathen from Tailwind CSS, okay. he, he used to make um, courses back in the day to do with Laravel. And, and when I was chatting to him, he, he mentioned something along these lines saying that mm -hmm. give away so much for free. It's in the form of blog posts, YouTube videos, and yep. so on. And you build up your community. They're very grateful. Um, yep. But often when someone's trying to actually get stuck in and learn something, they don't really want to fiddle about yeah. and try and find things that are kind of backwards order and a few loops. And here all of a sudden you're saying, hey, I've given away everything for free, fine. You can get it for free, fine. But here is everything beautifully formatted. Yep. Um, yep. Additional links per point, you know, and YouTube video is a bit all over the place and so on. And it's just a refined product. And he said that that worked really well for him. So takeaway there, don't be afraid to give away everything for free. People are paying for the convenience and the packaging and also just to try and give back to you. Love it, love all that. Were there any growth hacking experiments that surprised you just while, while making this stuff? Um, I think I think the one we mentioned, uh, basically the Twitter bio, that was okay. that was unbelievable. I, I just I uh -huh. couldn't I couldn't believe it. And and another one was which is really good is that I put coupons kind of everywhere. I planted coupons just uh -huh. just to see what happened. I've actually got some other products where I'll drop a coupon right at the bottom of the archives, and it almost con uh -huh. confirms people actually scroll there. And, and I think I have something like three hundred coupons created for the book and it's basically just throwing lines everywhere yeah. um another one uh what surprised me was parity pricing um, okay what does that mean parity pricing is basically um offering a discount to any people from countries that don't have um a strong purchasing power so a good right. example is um someone who's building landing pages for a company in san francisco could be earning you know five thousand dollars a month and then someone who's doing exactly the same thing in Delhi in India is earning $500 a month. And here's all of a sudden this book is $50. It's 10% of their income. Whereas, you know, yeah. in America, it's, it's, it's nothing, you know, cool, add it to the collection. Um, so what I did is I, I just, I wrote a message and I won't go too deep on this, but what surprised me is how amazing the communication was with the community. And I just mm. actually, I didn't set an automated parity price that just pops up. There are those services out there that do that. What I said is that, hey, if you are struggling with work um, anywhere in the world, or you're from a country that doesn't have strong purchasing power, just message me and just tell me what's up. Tell me where you are. And oh, wow. Someone will be like, even in, you know, Spain, which I, I you know, they don't earn that badly, but you know, sure, mm -hmm. less in other places. And I'll be like, hey, I went there, man. I went there in Spain. And then all of a sudden we just, he's like, did you try that place? And so the conversation with the community was absolutely amazing. But India, mm -hmm. we're obviously speaking about cricket. Um, and yeah, the, the, and, and generally mm -hmm. people are so grateful. Um, just yes. at that point, once you've given them a big discount and they're like, hey, I really want to succeed by improving my landing pages. And like, thank you so much for the discounts. I'll throw, an, I'll throw another growth hack at this point. At this point where they are grateful and have spoken to me about movies or location or whatever, mm -hmm. and we're just real human beings, I just tell them, I'm like, hey, if, if you enjoy the book, like if you enjoy the book, do you mind retweeting this tweet? Yeah. And it's like it, the, the conversion at that point that they're not going to retweet that is, is pretty much zero. And then someone mm -hmm. will go, hey, I've only got like 10 Twitter followers. And I'm like, don't even worry about it. Like, it's just another mm -hmm. count to the launch tweet that says it's like, you know, we've on 400 tweets. Every every little retweet counts. Um, mm -hmm. And I just really appreciate it. And yeah, so that was another like, so is that intentional? Did I speak to them to get the retweet? Absolutely not. But often when your intentions are in the right place, the sort of yeah. um, reward happens at the end. And it's just amazing. Yeah.
I love I love all that, and it's I, I think people I think humans like reciprocity. So if you give them a discount, they do. People I think people feel better. Wow, he gave me a discount. I want to do something for him, and just just ask of like, can you retweet this tweet? Like it's a very small ask, but people feel good that yeah. there's some reciprocity. So I I love hearing that. Good, it's great. good word. What of the day? Um, I love it. Uh, so let's talk about one of your passions. So one page love. Um, mm. What? Okay. So we have this ebook. How is one page love different? And then, and uh, you know, it sounds like the ebook is like um, is is good money, but not like career. Not like you're gonna like buy a boat money. Whereas it does sound like one page love. You turn from a side project into a full time career. Maybe not boat money yet. I, I don't. I don't know. But how did you turn something that is a side project into a full time career? Yeah. I mean. Golden question. I've been experimenting a long time. Um, I've, I think I was born with this uh, curiosity. I, want, I like to build things online. Um, I, I'm actually not that that good at coding. I, you know what? Let's actually go here. I'm actually not that good at anything. Um, it's like I'm, I'm, you know, that's you know, jack of all trades, master of none. I can design a bit. I can code a bit. I can market a bit. I'm, I, I don't see myself as a professional at anything. And I'm okay with it. I, I wasn't okay with it for a long time. You know, I had this bit of identity crisis online. So here I am building websites for clients, often, you know, 99% were WordPress websites. And, you know, on the sides, I was always, you know, looking at what other people were doing. So there's the Indie Hackers community, which is really great. If you are trying to get into this world, definitely subscribe to the Indie Hackers newsletter. Just tips off the tips people sharing their struggles, often the best stories are people that make their f their first dollar. That is really where yeah. the source is. And, you know, I was fascinated with this. So what I did, and and just to sidestep quickly, just to talk about where the bug mm -hmm. bit, is that often clients would give me, you know, half a page Word document of content, and it was just all caps. It was all capital <laughs> letters. And they're like, integrate <laughs> this in the website. And this is, you know, way back here, um, uh -huh. 2000 and. I want to say 2007 or 2008. Uh -huh. And, you know, now it's all native. You can do this stuff pretty much um, within yep. within your operating systems and Word and so on. And so anyway, I thought to myself, Rad, uh, let's create a little case converter. You know, let's convert mm. case online. So what I did, well, first of all, obviously I'm searching to do this online. And I see the solutions and they're really noisy and they, they got filled with ads and I'm like, this is terrible. This is not a good experience, you know? And you know what? Why don't we make this opportunity to, to do this myself? And I want to create the version I'd love because I also want to use this. So the big takeaway here mm -hmm. into creating the leap is you need to start scratching your own itch and start mm -hmm. creating products you'd appreciate and what you'd use. So I step back into Case Converter. I bought caseconverter.com. I hmm. paid my friend Nick, I think it was, oh, I don't know the currency at the time, $20. Okay. to code me the PHP yeah. script that, that you'd yeah. click the buttons and it would change yeah. the text and then copy the clipboard. And then I created ca this case converter site. And I was like, wow. And then all of a sudden, people started visiting. It. And I, start, I was using it more and more. I was telling friends about it and so on. And years passed. And I wasn't using it as much because it became a little bit more native in the software we were using. Mm -hmm. And then I heard of a site called Flipper. So this is a marketplace where people buy and sell websites and domains and so on. And okay. I thought to myself, why don't we just dabble here and see what happens? So I put caseconverter.com on Flipper with no reserve just to see what had happened. And I remember I was in Mozambique at the time. I actually kind of forgot about the end time and I was like checking email uh -huh. and so on. I was like, oh my word, this, this bid's ending soon. And two people started to, to bid against each other. It was a bit of a bidding war. Uh -huh. um, the site at the time is actually quite decent in hindsight. Like I probably shouldn't have sold it, but uh -huh. it, it uh -huh. had like really good passive traffic just through SEO. And was like, I think it was yeah. something like you know, 10,000 people a month or something. Um, and all of a sudden people started outbidding each other and I made $808 for the site that cost me like the domain was $10. The code was uh -huh. 20. Uh -huh. It was passive. I will, and I made eight hundred dollars. And do in South African rands, and I'm in Mozambique. I'm yeah. on I'm on the beach in Africa. It's like this is a lot yeah. of money. Yeah. And I at that point is I just saw myself. Nah, there's no ways I'm ever 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 gonna go full time on freelance anymore. Like uh -huh. I'm permanently gonna try and chase this forever. Mm -hmm. So I just started experimenting. I created you know just side project or side project. I wanted to interject here and I say Robhope.com forward slash graveyard is where I have listed. 
the full obituary of everything I've ever created. And what? it's got, t- yeah, it's got timelines. It's got everything. And what? it's where I, re- it's often where I go back and I remember how long the journey has been. And again, you know, people are like, Oh Rob, <sighs> one pitch left is so well. Yeah, yeah. I've failed 50 times. Yeah. Um, so anyway, you know, it was case converter, failure or success. Um, it's absolutely a success. And a lot of the projects that I don't work on were successes. I took mm-hmm. the learnings. I, I, mm-hmm. I you know, applied them into the next thing I was doing. So, yeah, this is a, a, a windy road, but you needed the context <laughs> in saying that I just knew that U.S. dollar is very powerful in Africa. Mm-hmm. And I don't need to make that much U.S. dollar mm-hmm. to actually right. quit freelance. Right. Um, I don't need, I don't, and the more I added value to my websites, the more I invested my own time and made them better, mm-hmm. the more people would return, the more people would talk about them. And mm-hmm. then through tons of experimentation and so on, you, you, you're monetizing just layers and layers and layers and layers, baby layers, lots of layers, failing, 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 but you start chipping away. And with every additional new layer, is one less client that you can take. And eventually yeah. I got to the point where I could take the leap and Sayonara, never look back, no more clients. Um, yeah. Side projects full time. It, it sounds, you know, amazing. You know, there's, there's lots to say about the whole journey, but I just want to add one bit of value for everyone is that, you know, how do you take the leap? You know, for mm-hmm. someone who's, who's, who's doing freelance right now and it's like, I'll do anything to work on my side projects full, full time. First bit of advice on this is you don't you also don't have to um, have the stress of worrying about you know sales all the time. A lot of people try and say, "Oh, I'll try to create a SaaS." It's very difficult to create a SaaS business, you know, where recurring income comes every month. I've been building online for over ten years and I've never got it right. Mm-hmm. So I just want to I just want to say that to everyone. And that and then when you are a reliant on sales, you start every month on zero dollars. So yeah. it, it can become a, a mental health challenge. So to answer, you know, I want to take the leap. You don't always have to take the leap. You can always just keep one or two clients to cover a home loan, to cover like a, the base costs yeah. and then just have just such a ball. Yeah. Um, I would I would advise that for anyone wanting to start. But if you truly hate the client game and speaking to people and you're a full introvert and you want to get your thing going, the answer is how can you provide as much value as I can to your niche? What would they want to see and read on that page and how, how can they do it and as fast as possible, unobtrusive, blazing experience. And that's how people return. That's how it becomes remarkable. And that's how you grow a community. Um, so there, there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, it's about adding value. How can you keep yourself? How can I add more value? And that's what I did with One Page Love every single day for what, eight years, mm-hmm. 10 years. And then I only took the leap. So yeah, I, th- so there's a lot there. Uh, and, um, I I love it for I love that you have the graveyard because I I've had a lot of side projects and some of them have worked really well and some of them have just disappeared right. Um, and I the side projects that I that I made that were pretty successful all took a really long time to ramp up for me. So for a while I had some plug WordPress plugins that I was selling on someone else's website. And I think at first it was like one sale. I think literally it was like one sale every one to two weeks. And I did one thing I did. I did have a little dollar sound whenever, whenever I got a Incredible. sale, which felt there's something psychological about just walking around town and hearing cha-ching in your pocket. Um, Amazing. That uh, it's, it's great. But then it, oh, and I think I made a couple, that was the first plugin. I made a couple more. And I think maybe by the end I had like nine of them. And then it was like, I actually had to turn off that notification because it would ring you know, five times a day when I'm in meetings or something, I'm in a meeting with what a client and it's going ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. You're like, okay, let me just turn my phone off. Um, but that, t- I think that took months to get to. And I also have LinkedIn learning courses and those also, it was a very, very long process. So there's something about start your side project, but then you have to give it weeks or months of time to, to grow to where it can actually support you. And you have to spend a lot of time reinvesting. So th- anyways, that's what I took away from your, your, from your comments there. I, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, in those projects that took really long, did yeah. you loathe any of them? Did you, did you say, wow, I actually really don't enjoy working on this, but I'm going to hang in there cause I'm going to make a lot of money. 
Yeah, so it's 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 super interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. What you were gonna say? Mm-hmm. So I was gonna say no. There there is a caveat. The caveat mm-hmm. is years and years later. Now I have to like refresh um, some of my courses. So creating all the plugins to begin with, or creating all these courses to begin with, is really exciting. And maybe even the second edition is so pretty exciting because you're like, oh, I I could make this better. I could I could make this a little bit better. I could have a better graphic here. But now I've refreshed some of my courses for the third time and. Maybe mm. that's a little tedious, but that's only once you've refreshed something three times, you know? Yeah. So like with with everything I'm doing, I, I can honestly say I, I'm enjoying it. There's nothing that feels yeah. like a chore. The chore part is often the, the marketing that sort of needs to be done yeah. afterwards. Like I know that if I sat on you know, a ton of podcasts, did, you know, guest posts for all these sites, I would sell more eBooks. It's like the most proven model. But I also just like building and designing and like, I, how do you want to spend your days? And this, my site makes, you know, enough money to live in Cape Town. There's no wrong answer here. Um, yeah. But but I often find that if some people don't in, like enjoying the product, if they don't enjoy working on the product, um, it's a very difficult task to work on it for a long time. And if you're not working on a long time, the likeness for that to finally succeed and get that hockey stick yes. growth is very low. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do want to move into this. So I know your, your time is running out here. So I do want to run uh, move into one or two fun questions if you got the time. Cool. So there's a game I like to play called Overrated Underrated. And basically mm-hmm. what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a word or phrase and you need to tell me if it's overrated or underrated. So if I said Christmas cookies, you might say underrated because who doesn't love having cookies in the home in December? Something like that. Sound good? Understood. All right. So the very first one, Gmail workspace apps. So that means Gmail, Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Sheets, etc. Overrated or underrated? The hardest underrated online at the moment. Oh. There okay. is no ways you can get that amount of quality value for $5 a month or $6 a month yeah. or whatever it is. It, the, all the emails land, custom domain, unlimited spreadsheets. It is just gold. It's just the absolute most underrated thing online. Not celebrated enough. Love it. Uh, how about the new year as in just like the holiday and how it, how it resets. So like the holiday of the new year, overrated or underrated? Totally overrated. Yeah. Just overrated. Why is it? What? It, I just, I like to focus and, um, everything is crowded. It, there's uh-huh. just so much okay. admin. There, there's okay. like, who's doing what? Um, I'm, I'm very much a, a, a guy who likes to take holidays off season. I okay. like going away, chasing waves midweek. Um, I'm that kind of guy. Um, I, you know, I work for myself. It's like when I'm sitting yep. in a queue around New Year's or in traffic because I'm yes. trying to get to a beach, yes. I, I think to myself, this is my fault. This is no one else's fault around <laughs> me. I am the problem. Yes, yes. I feel that way when I drive uh, is like if I choose to drive at five o'clock, there's traffic and I get annoyed and it's like I work from home. I could have easily taken off an hour at like 2 p.m. and driven and done this life. errand and then work a little bit later in the evening. But I yes, that my fault. Your fault. It's uh, your fault. Y- yeah. uh, all right. So I think I know this one now. Uh, Twitter overrated or underrated? Oh, massively underrated. It's basically, okay. it, it, it. no one talks about enough how you don't have to follow the news. You don't mm-hmm. have to follow the influencers making the noise. And you can really spend a lot of time muting words and you can yes. create your own motivational top up every morning. Every time I, I open up Twitter, every morning, full battery. It's just guys oh, cool. building amazing stuff, people bird watching, people surfing. It's amazing. Love it. And uh, last one here. What about owning a house? Like you own it, you don't rent it. Is that overrated or underrated? I think it, I think it depends uh, where you live in the world. I know this is, a, I'm not answering. So uh-huh. the answer is it's underrated. But I think, okay. you know, if you want to talk about the concept of moving out of home and, you know, doing your own thing early in life, and that's only when you're successful. I've seen this, you know, narrative, especially in South Africa. But, you know, in Europe, you you hang with your parents and, you keep expenses low and you spend time with your family and that's, that's amazing. You know, keep, keep that cash flow, uh, invest it somewhere else. Incredible. But for us here, owning your own bit of land and it's a forced saving where I don't, I, I've got yes. no choice. So every yes. month where like, you know, PayPal does this and it comes through and there's ebook sales and so on. 
And it's like, guess what? I have to put a chunk into the, give it to the bank um, because I have no choice. And guess what happens at the end of the day? I have my own home um, yeah. and it's a forced saving. So I'm a big fan of a home loan. I actually just bought a, a plot um, up the nice. coast. Nice. Awesome. Well, I, I'm another, sure sometime we'll, saving. we'll, we'll for savings. Love that. I, I agree. I agree with you on for savings for sure. Love that. So, so we're running a little short on time and I have a ton of more business questions, but I want to get to a couple of personal questions. So let me, let me skip ahead a little bit here. Um, I I do want to know what are your plans for love curated going forward? Do you have, um, a grand vision? So love curated, um, is my parent company, the umbrella company for one page love. Um, and, uh, and the second love site is email love and there's UX love and the yo podcast that I have is sort of sitting under this. It was mainly for tax reasons to start this. Mm. Um, it just makes things a little bit cleaner, you know, all this, you know, an ebook income doesn't just go strictly into the personal bank accounts. It's, it becomes yeah. a little bit of a, a bird's nest. And, you know, I got, you know, we're also into Vatland now in South Africa. Um, things are, there's a lot mm. more admin and unfortunately, and I, I don't want to be negative on this point, but when you, when you deal with this much admin, you actually need to break through a certain earning barrier to make it all worth it. It's mm. just the amount of time I spend on, you know, just with accountants and explaining things. And, you know, cause there's lots of digital transactions and just yeah. a little more context. And I promise I won't go deep here, but you know, every single transaction is in a d- different country and it's not in America, it's not in South Africa. So I don't have to add that to it, Yeah, but it needs to be explained and accounted for. And what happened when that sale was made through Gumroad? Did it sit in Gumroad for 30 days? Did it sit for like, you know, 14 days? Was there interest mm-hmm. made on that? And and then that mm-hmm. goes into PayPal and then it goes into the, and there's just layers and layers. So the point I'm getting at is I've spent this, I started the company this year and I've spent most of the year just on admin, getting systems in place, mm-hmm. explaining to accountants how things work. And I feel like honestly, to make this all worth it, I have to increase revenue. It's something I've never, ever, um, aimed for in my life it was always just to create freedom in my life and yes. and i did you know through one page love but now i i'm actually looking to ramp up revenue and i want to be able to create more output um yeah. so i'd like to create more youtube videos i'd like to interview more people on the podcast and you know being a solo person i am the bottleneck um often mm-hmm. when i go into podcast i go all in and then afterwards i'll just edit mm-hmm. it and i freeze my entire life next thing you know i have an updated one page love in like you know 12 <laughs> days or something so yeah. i've hired someone this year sort of part-time uh four days mm-hmm. a week and we are getting our systems in place we are getting consistent we have a cadence for newsletters um we we are growing things are good but who's editing these videos, who's editing these podcasts and who's paying for these people. So we're sort of at a, you know, this point in one page love, and now we planning to add more layers of digital products. And then we're hopefully going to grow the team and organically do this, this thing that people know as bootstrapping. Can can I ask about scaling? Cause I I think I've run into, I've worked in a couple of businesses. I've worked with freelancers. I've worked with part-time people. And I think there's a couple of different routes you can take. And I, I have my own bias, so I'm curious what yours is, where I think some people hire one person to do a very specific job. So it's like your only Mm. job is maybe it's four hours, maybe it's an hour a day, five hours a week or something, is to answer customer queries and to, you know, give them refunds if they want refunds and give them the coupon if they wanted the coupon, like, you know, some sort of like customer support. And then you hire a bunch of people who all do very specific tasks. Yeah. And then there's people who are like, okay, I just need a second me um, so I'm going to do the podcast, but I want you to record the pot or to edit the podcast. And I want you to also answer some customer support stuff and also, uh, you know, up- update the coupons and gum road, what- whatever. So do you go for the more general person to help you who can sort of do a little bit of everything? Or do you go for like very, very small specialists who are all good at one specific thing? So in my case, I think. I think the answer was to try and replace me in as many fields as possible. Um, just so I have that ultimate freedom to do something and focus on something, but it's really difficult. Um, especially, you know, the person I hired, you know, shame, she's incredible. She's quite a Swiss army knife, but Mm. I can just see, you know, I've, I've been absolutely consumed by this online world that I've created myself, um, Mm -hmm. for 12 years and she has to learn all the nuances. 
And it's like, yeah, like even today, you know, we're working on Figma and we're talking about spacing and auto layout, and then we're uh-huh. creating videos in, in screen flow. And I'm talking about fading into the beginning part to loop. And then I'm like, upload this in WordPress and, you know, put it in the custom field and then, you know, sort this. There's just, there's layers and layers and layers. And I can see it gets overwhelming. Um, there's mm-hmm. a lot of back and forth. So I think the answer there is that when you do hire this person that's sort of trying to replace yourself, try and batch as many tasks as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, just like too much back and forth is just like a little bit of a hectic route for them. But the mm-hmm. answer to your question is that I think you need to aim for the latter and you need to aim for the specialists. Like like with a good, a good example, like just using my example is that um, the podcast, you know, like I've got a podcast recording next week and I would, I would love my employee employee that I'm paying to also help me with like editing, but then, yeah. you know, she's not a podcast editor. Um, you know, I'm quite particular with certain things as well. And like, I'm, you know, sound is big for me and I want to integrate music and she has to like step inside my brain and try and sync an intermission, which is a fun quiz with the beat. And yes. like, I have to sort of spec that. So do yeah. I dive in? Do I hire an actual podcast person? And I think the answer, which I have not successfully done at all, I think the answer is this, is that you need to batch produce everything. So it's 10 podcasts yes. and you yep. brief to a specialist on how to yep. sync to a beat and you get those all out. But I I just haven't got that in me yet to you know arrange 10 people to record yep. in 10 weeks with everything I'm juggling at the moment. Um, so to answer your question, aim for specialists. Um, but if you are a solo person, basically a VA style person really does help. Um, also where I'm planning on going with, which is a team where there is someone that's editing video, where there is someone doing X, Y, and Z, if she can sort of be the glue when I'm not there and know how everything works, um, I think is a smart long-term play. So that's where I'm in. Cool. Love that. And definitely agree on batching podcasts. That's a, it's a, even if you can get two a day, that's better than one a week. Um, you know. Wow. Um, so we are basically out of time, but I have to ask you, like, there, I, I want to make sure that I want to try to make these podcasts like there's also a person behind this growth hacker. Like you're obviously growth hacking is is a, a big thing here. Um, and I'm t- I, I know you do trail running. I know you do bird rot- watching. You do some surfing. Uh, you were in a band. There's a lot of stuff right there. How about this? Which of those four things is your favorite? Let's start with that. Yeah. So it's, there's no question it's surfing. So okay. I've been surfing about 25 years and, you know, we go through phases like trail running and so on. And, you know, you, you said playing in a band, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's a cool phase, you know, there's no way it's sustainable. <laughs> um, but with surfing, <laughs> surfing is the one thing that you, you, you are always seeking this offset from staring at the glowing rectangle all day. Mm-hmm. And surfing is just the place where you have no phone. You, no one's contacting you um, and you're actually trying to achieve a few things in the water. And one of the things that not a lot of people know is that you get a thing called barrel riding and it's being inside of the wave. So the wave curls and over what's you. what's it called? It's called barrel riding. So tube barrel, riding, barrel riding, um, got getting it, got tubed it. or whatever. Oh, it's, it's quite cringe explaining it as a surfer, but like it's basically being inside the wave. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I can't. I it's it's just there are no words for the feeling of spending so much time investing in a sport and getting to the f- to the skill level where you can paddle out at a place that's you know the waves are of consequence. There's yeah. there's reef below you. Um, yeah. There's people all around you that want the same thing. It's competitive, and you put in your mm-hmm. time, and then the wave comes and you, you're patient and then it's your turn Uh and you get it and you don't fall and you Uh position yourself just perfectly. And next thing you know, you're inside a bubble of water Uh Uh and the whole world is, you know, it's just one big liquid ball. And then you come out again and you, you come out unhurt and you just took this little trip inside of the sea. Um, there's so many different ways to phrase this. Um, yeah, but it's, it's just that you, you cannot explain the joy you get from surfing, um, just being in the sea with friends. Uh, it's, it's actually dictated a lot where I've been in the world, Indonesia, you know, Portugal. I've, I've just, I've been seeking waves. It's been a narrative. I've met so many friends just because I've paddled past them in the water. Mm-hmm. I like their vibe. Mm-hmm. We got chatting on the beach. We hoot each other yeah. on as they take waves. A huge part of my life is surfing. Um, I've taken quite a like a break on it to, to get into trail running, new challenges. 
um, bird yeah. watching. I'm bird watching way more now. Um, uh-huh. But like with surfing, it is the absolute holy grail when it comes to just being offline and just feeling good. I love that, and I love. And I've, I've tried surfing, by the way, and I'm very bad at mm. it. Um, but but <laughs> I love. There's a moment. I love there's that flow state, right? Of like, I want to ride in that tube. I want to yeah. ride in that tube of water. That is a really cool goal. And it's, you have to be so good. You have to time it perfectly. You don't, you don't want to run into someone else who's also doing the same thing. There's, there's a lot of variables. So I can see how it's magic when you get there. It's, it's, so I love it's that. it feels like you're in the impossible. I love it. Um, okay. So, so we are over time. I had so many other questions, but final question there are a lot of people with landing pages for their their products. Uh, a lot of people probably listening to this are like WordPress products. Any final thoughts on how to improve conversions? Absolutely. Um, so a huge part with landing pages is that you've spent a lot of time involved in your product, involved in your niche. Um, you know, you're on a very technical level and you just start you know, splashing down information on the page. And you're often thinking like, oh, I just got to add as much as possible, much as possible. It's not often the case when it comes to landing page optimization. The real secret is you're trying to convince people with as little as possible, not as much as possible. As soon as you add too much text, it becomes overwhelming. A lot of your mm-hmm. message that you're trying to say is drowned with just so much clutter in the page. So again, you can see I'm just drawn to the simplicity of one page websites, landing pages, simple design. But what you need to ask yourself is that, you know, who who is my audience? And, you know, how does your product solve their problem? Okay, so you need to actually write these things down. Often when you write this down, it engraves it in your brain much better than, you know, you can th- mm-hmm. you think in your head out. And now you need to ask yourself is what would that person who's got that problem need to see and read in the landing page to be persuaded to act. Mm -hmm. So, so, so like, I'm just going to say it again. So like, what would they actually need to see in this page, you know, and, and, and visually see to be persuaded to use a credit card. So, you know, this is all sounding very trivial at this point, but when you start actually breaking it down and actually eliminating through this exercise, you really get somewhere. So let's use a a real ridiculous example, 40 FAQs, you know, 40 FAQs. It's like, no, 40 testimonials, no. Um, Embedded YouTube videos, 12 of them. Yeah. Slowing down the page. What you need to do is you need to curate and you need to filter all your content to the core stuff, okay? But now once you've got and you've stripped it all down and you know the content's good, now you need to start refining it. And what you're going to do for your WordPress customer or any customer is that you need to ask them, um, you know, what testimonial would they like to see or read Right. that is maybe answering a doubt that they have? You know, which testimonial out of this bunch is actually highlighting a feature, which is one of our unique selling points. So here's like, you know, two testimonials, just for example, the one is from a Sarah and it says, damn, I love this product, you know, and you've got that. I've, I see this all the time when I'm doing the landing page orders, people like that is such a good testimonial. Um, they add like eight of them and there's just no value. There's no weight yeah. at all to this. But one of the testimonials says, this WordPress plugin saves us no less than 10 hours a month ec- from manually exporting CSVs. It's like, that's the testimonial. And it's like, yeah. and, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Like it's a unique selling point. It's a predator. Okay. So, so often the ones are like, you know, save it, how does it save you time? Um, how how can it make, help them make money? So you talk about oh this plugin yeah. increased our revenue by twenty. And there's I won't I won't go too deep on this on this point, yeah. but it's about hand picking everything in the page that aligns with what they'd want to see and read to be persuaded to be convinced. Okay, and just to f- to finish up on this total point is that there's three ways you can um, you can kind of pitch your product to someone, and the one is mm-hmm. you can basically tell them. Hey, our product's amazing. Hey, our WordPress plugin is amazing. You know, trust us, it's amazing. Other one is you get other people to tell them. Mm-hmm. So those are testimonials. This is your social proof. 
You know, this is your ratings. So this is like, you know, don't take our word for it, take everyone else's word for it. And that's better than the first one. So this mm-hmm. is like a bit of a hierarchy. But what's the third one? Is you show them. So it's 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 don't tell them, don't let others tell them, you show them. And I'm the biggest fan of landing pages that can visually display just the magic that's actually happened. Show me the transformation. Show me that WordPress plugin that, you know, had that really gross, like, or maybe like a desktop of CSV documents, you know, and you're about Uh, to like (laughs) drag them into um, QuickBooks or something. But this one goes like, it just shows a button and going export to QuickBooks. And and again, with showing is like a static image, great. But what about just a little video that just like showed the mouse going boom and Mm -hmm. the the bar went and it said synced. That is showing them with an in-page demo, and that is the absolute X factor to landing page optimization. I love that. I I love that. Um, I I have, I have a couple examples of that, but I, I we're yeah. so over time now, so I, I won't share. Oh, yeah. But I love I love showing them rather than telling them. That's super good. Rob, thank you so much for being on the podcast. We love having you here. This was really great. I think you really helped the listeners. I do want to mention we have the freemius coupon for 50% off of your ebook at robhope.com slash freemius. Uh, just go to that URL. It'll automatically apply it to your cart. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Plugin.fm podcast, which is powered by Freemius. You can go to Plugin.fm to find this episode and future episodes. And you can check out Freemius.com if you want to start, uh, want help selling your premium WordPress plugin or plugins. My name is Patrick Rolland, and thank you again, Rob. Thank you for having me, Patrick. Thanks, Fova. Thanks, Freemius. You're doing a great job.